Hallelujah. I feel like I'm going to a church where either, even Kanye West can get saved. I mean, what's God up to? Whoa. It's amazing that on uh, Facebook, people are arguing. Some think he's saved. Some think he's not saved. Some think he doesn't have a right to be saved. It's crazy. Can you imagine that we think that we can keep someone out of the kingdom of heaven because of their past? And it's going on. Preachers are talking about it. He's not saved. He can't be saved. You know, we pray for these people. We pray for these people to come to Christ. And then when they come to Christ, we decide they can't be saved. We're the gatekeepers. It's ridiculous. I remember mean, years ago, do you remember that song, Raindrops Came Falling on My Head? Some of you do. They're just telling your age. Raindrops keep falling on my head. That was B.J. Thomas. B.J. Thomas came to Christ. What? B.J. Thomas, right? B.J. Thomas, there was a fellow that used to be in our church years ago. He used to play bass guitar for him. And... Uh, um, it was amazing. Here, BJ gets saved. I visited with him. He was here locally, and we went in a, uh, we sat in his big bus, and we talked about the Lord, and he talked about his experience of salvation. So then he gets saved and proclaims uh, to the world that he's born again, and he starts doing Christian music. And you know who fought him the most? The church. And I sat in that coach with him, me and uh, this fellow that used to play bass guitar here and used to play bass for him. And he just cried out and talked about the experience he had and how God had saved him. And I'm thankful that we have a church that whomsoever will let them come. Come on, put your hands together and give God some praise. I grew up in New York. I grew up in a, uh, I went to about an 85% black High school across the street, across the main uh, Islip Avenue was a place called Brentwood. And Brentwood had a lot of Hispanics. And so there was a lot of conflict between Central Islip and Hispanic. And I lived right on the, right on the border there. I lived right off of Islip Avenue. On one side was Central Islip and on the next side was Brentwood. And there was a store. It was a little store. As a matter of fact, they called it 7-Eleven before there were ever 7-Elevens. And there was an older Hispanic couple that started that little store. And, and um, we used to go in there all the time, sometimes. And it was on the Brentwood side of the street. And so uh, you couldn't go over there if you were a CI boy. And you had to be a CI boy because we were the musketeers and we weren't afraid of anything. So if you were a CI boy, you let everybody know you were a CI boy. The problem is there were the Fifth Avenue boys and the Fifth Avenue boys were from Brentwood. And so the Fifth Avenue boys decided that that was their turf. And so if we went to over there, or we wanted to go over there for Oreos and and chocolate milk. We had to make sure there were more of us than there were of them. And so we'd kind of scope the place out. We'd stay on our side of the Islip Avenue. We'd look over there and try to figure out how many of the Brentwood boys were there and the Fifth Avenue boys were there. And if we could, have, if there were more of us than there were of them, then we'd go over and do what we want. And we decided for that short period of time we were there, it was our turf. And it was a turf war. It went on for many, many, many years. I was there one time with a bunch of my friends, and there, were, and there was a guy from Brentwood that showed up, and I, can't, I think he had a 1963 Chevy Impala, and he pulled up real shiny, and uh, there were like six or eight of us, and he was all by himself, and I thought he was one of those Brentwood boys. So I'm the littlest with the biggest mouth, and so I go over to him, and I say, hey, uh, he's got his window down. I said, where are you from, man? You look like one of them Brentwood boys. He said, yeah, I'm from Brentwood. I said, you are, are you? So I, tell, I start yelling through his window. I said, um, you don't belong here, man. This is our turf. Da -da 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 -da. The only reason I was doing that was because there were more of us, and there was only one of him. And so you know what he does? He backs up, 
pulls forward and runs me over. <laughs> Ran over both of my legs. I don't want to tell you what that Chevy Impala looked like before he left there. You could barely recognize it as a car because the guys that were with me beat his car up really bad and chased him down the street. Now, I don't suggest you do that, at least not on a Sunday. <laughs> but I was brave, man. I was outspoken. I was little. I was really chicken at heart, but I was brave because I was going to let you know because there was more of us than there, were, than there was you. And so all of a sudden, I got great courage. But I'm here to tell you there's more for you than there is against you. Turn to somebody and tell them there's more for you than there is against you. Now, I pray, I pray today that you'll really get that way down deep on the inside of you, that you don't have to be afraid of anything. And anything that God has asked you to do, you can do it. Because there's more for you than there are against you. Now, I don't know about you. There have been times in my life I have felt like I'm all alone. Even when it came to the things that I knew God wanted me to do, I felt like there were so many things against me. Sometimes even church folks. You're trying to do something for the kingdom of God. You're trying to do something, do the right thing, and all of a sudden you find out that there are people that are talking and people that aren't for you, and you feel all alone. It's terrible, man. And when you feel that, you have, a, you have a tendency to stay isolated. You won't go out. You won't venture forward. You won't put your hand to do the things that God has asked you to do. But it's terrible. It's terrible to feel that way. You know, I've at times, you know, stayed up at night thinking about who was for me, who was against me. And in the middle of the night, I made a decision whether I was going to get up in the morning. That's how depressed, how paralyzed, paralyzed me. But I'm here to tell you there are more that are for you than there are against you. There's something I, I, I want to bring to your attention, and maybe you can do a Bible study all by yourself in, in regard to this. Oftentimes, when we talk about encouraging people who feel all alone, what we attempt to do is to talk to them about the abiding presence of God. That Christ is not only with you, but Christ is in you. And, it, and, and I, I call it the presence of his presence. You know, he's ever present. He said, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. And I, you try to encourage people with that. And for some people, that's enough. But some people, they need just a little bit more information. And I want to talk to you about something else. Hopefully, if you get a hold of it, it'll encourage you and you really will realize that you are never alone. And that is, I want to talk to you about angels. Turn to somebody and tell them angels. angels. We don't study angels. We don't take any time in the scripture uh, to learn about angels, to learn about what they do. Are they real? Uh, now, you know, Hollywood seems to be, you know, they like, what do they call it? The paranormal. They have all of these things on television. They had series about angels and they have series about demons and devils and there have been movies and television things about paranormal activity. And also angels. In 1967, uh, there was uh, uh, Israel warred against three different nations. It was Egypt... Syria, and Jordan. And they went to war. Israel was only a nation for what? When they were in the 40s, they became, huh? 1948, this is in 1967. They go to war with three other nations. It's three nations against Israel. And so they, they go to war, and the war lasted for six days. In six days, they defeated three other nations, and they were, they were poorly equipped to do the job. And the secular people said, now the, the people of faith said something else, 
But the secular people wrote, and you can go on, on, online and look up that, and you actually read about it. They said there were paranormal activity, and that paranormal activity favored Israel. The, their enemies would shoot a bomb, you know, a, a rocket off, and the rocket would burst in midair. It never hit its target. And here these people were, they they were not prepared as much as their enemies were. And they would shoot something off and it hit their target every single time. There were, I can't remember, Dan read it in the first, but there were tens of thousands of people that were killed from those three different nations. And only 700 from the ranks of the Israeli army. Secular people said there was paranormal activity. But you know what people of faith said? There were angels that were involved in protecting Israel. Oh, come on and put your hands together and give God some praise. (laughs) Brother Joe Crandall, remember Brother Crandall? His mother was over there and she witnessed it and she literally saw angels defending and fighting for Israel. Israel, uh, 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 angels are real. Turn to somebody and tell them angels are real. We don't talk about it. We think that maybe people think we're like too far out there. But they are real. And I just want to take a look in the scriptures this morning that you will believe that you are never, ever, ever, ever alone. Tell somebody you are never, ever, 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 never, ever Never alone. (laughs) Isaiah chapter 47 and verse 4. Our Redeemer. Who's our Redeemer? Say it, Jesus. Jesus. He is the Lord of hosts, is his name. Our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, is his name. The Holy One of Israel. This is very interesting where it says the Lord of hosts. It is a compound name of God. There are many compound names of God that you find in reading the scriptures. But this is mentioned more than all the rest of them. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. Hosts are the hosts that it's talking about that he's Lord over is a company of warring angels. It is the army of God. He is our redeemer is the Lord or he is the commander of a Lord of hosts. And host literally means warring angels, a company of warring angels. Does angels sound familiar to you in any way when it comes to the birth of Christ? Do you remember angels showed up at the birth of Christ? I I was thinking about this, and and, and I thought, well, maybe it's just something we do. But we literally, we have five children. Some of them are are better behaved than the others. Um, (laughs) Some of them got a lot more spanking than the others. And uh, but we celebrate all their birthdays. You know, we we know, you know, we, we had five. Uh, it seemed like we always were having a birthday. And the youngest, Matt, I don't know, maybe in the end, uh, did, what did we just give him one cupcake or something? It just got to that point. But we always were celebrating their birth. At the celebration of the birth of Christ, guess who showed up? Angels. Now, now, now maybe I'm stretching this a little bit, but you know what? Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. He was the firstborn. There are others that would be born from on high that would come after him. And those that followed are me and you. Jesus was the firstborn among many brethren. And those of us who are born again, turn to somebody and tell them born again. Those of us who have come to Christ and we are born again, we are those brothers that would follow after the first brother. And I just wonder, I mean, I'm just wondering, you know, I'm getting older, so I can think this way, I guess. I'm just wondering if heaven celebrated the birth of the firstborn, I wonder if heaven has celebrated the rest of those that would follow after. 
And those that would follow after were those of us who were born again because we are daughters and sons of the living God. We are the children of God. Now, I just wonder, I'm just thinking, I, I wonder, because I've seen some things in my own life, I just wonder if there are angels that showed up and were assigned to each and every one of us when we were born again. Maybe you don't want it, but I sure need it. There was a lady that we visit, used to visit up in Pennsylvania. Uh, she spent a lot of time with my grandma. Her, mom, her name was Mama Bates. And Mama Bates had a church on Market Street in Philadelphia. And at that time, Market Street was a very difficult place. And my grandma took me there when I was about 11, 12 years old. I think it was 11 or 12 years old. And Mama Bates pastored this church all by herself in a very difficult area there in Philadelphia. And it was called Market Street. And so she had this church there. And um, I remember going there with my mother, it was kind of, my grandmother. It was kind of fun because in the middle, uh, they'd have church in the morning for about three hours, three and a half hours. And then they would break and they'd all come back a few hours later and they'd have church till 10, 11 o'clock at night. I mean, it was like an all day thing. And I'll never forget, I went there with my grandma, and in the middle of church, they end church. It's like suddenly they just ended church, and everybody started breaking out lunch. There's fried chicken, black eyed peas, cornbread, some barbecue, yeah, corn on the cob. I mean, it was like, now that's the kind of church you want to go to. Now, Mama Bates only lived a few blocks from the little church that she had established there. She only lived a few blocks. Her husband was not saved. And every single night, Mama Bates would take the day's offering and she would carry it home with her. Now, she heard this story from two guys who had gotten saved uh, years later, but she, every single night she'd go home. And they told her this story. They said, Mama Bates, you know, uh, we, we really plotted to do some terrible things to you on your way home on Sunday nights. We knew you were carrying that money. And she said, well, what happened? What, 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 you, why didn't you ever do anything? He, she said, you know, they said every time you left the church, there were two big dudes that would come by your side and follow you all the way home. And every time we tried to get close to you or sneak up on you or grab you, they were there. And she said, there was never anyone that ever followed me home from the church. I always went by myself. I went by myself for 30 years. And then she realized those big dudes were not, they weren't deacons, they were associate pastors, they were angelic beings that protected her all of those years. And eventually those guys gave up on trying to rob Mama Bates and they decided to get saved. Come on and give God some praise with me. Real story. And the Bible is filled with stories about angels. I'm hoping that you'll leave here today. Not only is Jesus with you, not only is Jesus in you, but he is the host of a whole army of angels that has been given an assignment to watch over you. You like it? Oh, that's New York talking over there. Can you tell she's from Long Island? As soon as I heard her this morning, I said, now that lady is from Long Island. There's more for us than there are against us. Psalm 91, verse 11. For he will give his angels charge concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. The Lord of hosts has assigned some of his angels just to take care of you. Tell somebody just to take care of me. <laughs> Psalm 34 and verse 7. And the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and he rescues them. 
there are angels. Now, someone tried to come up with a how many angels there are. And the scripture says they're innumerable. You can't count them. And, and there are, supposedly, there are like nine battalions in this army of the Lord, which is made up of warring angels. And every battalion has billions upon billions. I don't know how they came up with this. Upon billions, upon billions, upon billions and billions and billions. Every battalion has billions and billions and billions of angels. All angels have assignments, but all of them have a common assignment. All of them do different things out of those nine battalions. There are nine battalions with billions and billions. Hey, somebody can add this up, can't you? Billions and billions and billions. Come on, banker, you know how many that is. That's how many angels there are. They are created beings. That God has created. Now I'm going to tell you something about those devils. Those fallen angels that became demons. They were limited. In number. They were limited. Those fallen angels were limited. But over the years. God the creator. Has continued. To create angels. I know some of you look at me like he's crazy. Was like, no, no this is real. It's biblical. The Bible says even sometimes we entertain angels unaware. But God, the creator, over the centuries and over the years, has continued to create angels. Come on, someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. But there was only a certain amount of angels that were fallen that became demons. I'm here to tell you, even when it comes to the heavenly, even it comes to the spiritual world, there are more that are for us than possibly can be against us. Come on and put your hands together and give the Lord some praise. Tell him, hey, there's an angel watching over me. I notice what I like the word in camps. I mean, some of us, you know, like, we, we don't need this angel that just kind of like every now and then visits, you know what I mean? He just, he needs a camp around us. I mean, he just needs to, like, you know what I mean? This is your job, you know? I'm not looking at you. Don't, don't they look wonderful? They just got married last Saturday. Saturday before last. This rascal snuck in here and stole one of the, all of the women here are good women, best women, but one of our best. He didn't what? Oh, we're going to work on that. We're going to get a dowry out of him for sure. I'm so proud of you. That was such a fun wedding. Wasn't it fun? And that sister of yours, how tall is she? Six foot two. Six foot two. She looked like, did she have heels on? Well, maybe I'm shrinking because she. She's the baby. She's the baby. She was a character. That was the funnest thing. And I love you. I'm so excited about the future and the great things. And God has great things for you to do. And remember, you are never, never, ever, 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 ever alone. Come on and give them a hand. Will you do that with me? Hebrews chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. But to which of these angels was ever said, sit at my right hand until I make our enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who have inherited salvation? You know what? You are here this morning and you are born again because you inherited salvation. Let me tell you something. You didn't choose God. God chose you. Come on, someone say amen. amen. I mean, some of you were living under a rock somewhere. And some of you, I know it literally was a rock. If you know what I mean. 
You were living under some rock. You were living under some cloud. You were living in a world that was so dark and full of, uh, full of uh, 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 you know, misery. But the Lord Jesus Christ decided that's one of mine. And he touched your life and he chose you to be saved. You are sitting here this morning and born again because you're chosen. You have inherited salvation. Come on, someone say hallelujah with me. And there are ministering spirits. There are angels that have been assigned to watch over you. If anybody leaves here today feeling like you're alone, knock it off, will you? Call me. I'll swat you in the face. No, I won't. Get over it. Not only is Christ himself with you, but there's a host of angels that are surrounding you. Those of you that have inherited salvation, come on, give God some praise with me. In 2 Kings chapter 19, we don't have to go there. There was one angel that slew 185,000 of the enemies of Israel. I like this story. 2 Kings chapter 6. Now when the attendant of the man of God was risen early and he had gone out, behold, an army with horses and chariots were circling the city. And his servants said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? I don't know if you've ever been there and you felt so lonely and felt like there were those of your enemy who had just gathered around you and said, What am I going to do? He said, to, he said to the master, what are we going to do? And he answered and said, do not fear. For those who are with us. Oh, boy, oh, boy. My fingers don't work anymore. Okay. Is it on the fair? Are more than those who are with them. And then Elijah prayed. He said, oh, Lord. I pray his eye, I pray you open his eyes that he might see. And the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he saw. And behold, the mountain was filled with horses and with chariots of fire. All around Elijah said, strike this people with blindness. Now, listen, you know the rest of the story. All of those that came to destroy Elijah and his company, they were sm smitten with blindness. You know what I, I'm asking the Lord to do? I'm asking the Lord will do the same thing with me and you. That the prophet prayed over his servant. It is time for our spiritual eyes to be open. It is time for us to have a reassurance way down deep in the side of us. That we can continue, continue to do the work of the kingdom regardless of how many are against us. Regardless of who, who has said what about, about us. Regardless of what we have in our hand or we don't have in our hand. If God has asked you to do something, go ahead and do it. If God has asked you to do it, do it. Because more that's with you than it is against you. Amen. And I pray that our eyes will be opened. When it comes to justice and righteousness and doing the bidding of the Lord, I pray that you will not hold back. Everything we've done here, we started with nothing. I know I've told this story before. We have about $12 million dollars worth of property and I think we owe about maybe a million dollars we have 12 million dollars of property paid for turn to somebody tell them paid for impossible impossible with this group when we take up the offering all we can hear is change I'll never forget those properties on 27th Street. Lee Weatherington family. 
what they call it, family village. I'll never forget it. We desperately needed housing for homeless families. Desperately needed housing. And we also have some, we have some unaccompanied youth that also live there too, that have got no longer in foster care. They aged out of it. Desperately needed it. It was a desperate, desperate place. The police, the sheriff's department said they wouldn't even go in there. That's how bad it was. That's how terrible it was. They wouldn't go in there. They'd just follow a car when they left at night, stop them. They'd always be drugs. There was open sewers, prostitution, all kinds of things going on there. And so, (laughs) I'll never forget it. But I investigated trying to purchase them. And we didn't have, we had $10,000. And I put an offer in. First of all, I didn't, wasn't going to put an offer in because it was just too destroyed. I know I've told this story. Too messed up. We didn't have enough resources, enough money. And so Aaron has got me in more trouble than that. He says to me, Dad... You never let that stop you before. Well, I've told this story, and Lee is here, so I don't want to embarrass him. But I needed $300,000 in a couple days, a few days, to purchase that property. And then we needed another million dollars after that to fix it up. And so Lee was crazy enough to take us to lunch, not knowing what was going to happen next. And so he said, I just want to hear what you guys are doing. So we started to tell him about that property. And make a long story short, in about 45 minutes, we needed, I needed $285,000 in no time. In about 45 minutes, of eating lunch, Lee raised $300,000. You know what he said to me, don't you? He was going to buy lunch, and he didn't buy lunch. Because I gave my son the credit card to go buy lunch. Matt was with us, and I gave him my credit card and bought lunch. And so he found out we bought lunch, and he got upset. Why did you buy lunch? I invited you to come out. And so, he, so I don't know what they were doing. I guess they were just kidding around. And he said, well, you know, I was going to give you $50,000, but I'm not going to give it to you now. I'm like, why? Do you remember doing this, Lee? I don't know whether you do or not. I said, why? He said, well, you bought lunch. <laughs> so, oh, okay, you know, if that got me in trouble, I guess it did. He said, no, I'm not going to give you $50,000. I'm going to give you $100,000. And you know what I always thought? I regretted one thing about that day. I should have bought him dinner. (laughs) Miraculous. I don't know, was there an angel sitting on your your lap? Because you were looking a little like way down there for a minute. Angels are created human beings. They don't marry. We're not to worship them. They live for other, uh, forever. Of course, there are different kinds. There are nine different battalions of angels. And there are too many angels to possibly count. Let's go on here. Don't fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And then Elijah prayed and said, Oh, Lord, I pray, open their eyes. That's what my prayer is today, that our eyes will be opened to see how many of those ministering spirits have been assigned to watch over us and to take care of us. David found himself. The Philistines encamped against them. They were the enemy of Israel. And he had a small army, and he was outnumbered. And David goes to pursue the Philistines, 
although he was outnumbered by many, 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 many men, he decides he's going to do battle with the Philistines. And the Lord says to him, he said, I don't want you to confront them face to face. He said, I want you to go around behind them. And he said, this is what the Lord said to David. He said, this is what I want you to do. He said, I want you to wait there. And I don't want you to attempt to enter into the enemy's camp until you hear the King James Version says the rustling in the mulberry tree. You know what the other translation says? Until you hear the marching of soldiers. And he said, then I will send my army and I will destroy your enemy. You know what happened? They didn't do, they didn't enter in until they heard the marching of soldiers and the mulberry tree. And the Lord God Almighty sent a host of angels and destroyed all of the Philistines. They came to do war with the Israelites. And when they walked in, all of their enemies were dead because of those angelic armies who the Lord has assigned to even take care of me and you. I want you to leave here big. I want you to leave here just like this little fellow that walked into that 7-Eleven said, we're in charge now. <laughs> just don't get run over, okay? That's how I want you to live your life. That's how I want you to embrace tomorrow. That's how I want you to take hold of those things that God has asked you to do and don't hold back. This is not about politics, about who's for you and who's against you. It's about an assignment that God has given you to do. And so go ahead and do it because there are more that are for you than are against you. I want you to talk about it. I want you to think about it. I want you to dream about it. And when you go to do something and you realize that God has given you great favor, maybe, just maybe, that God himself has kept you and protected you and there are angels that have been watching over you. And I say, if he celebrated the birth of his son, he celebrates you with angels when you were born again. Amen. So Father, we thank you for your loving kindness. Everyone stand with me. I pray that your family will go forth today encouraged and strengthened knowing that there's a whole host of angels that are watching over us taking care of us. You've assigned to them. You made, gave them an assignment to watch over us and care for us and to go before us and to prepare the way and to defeat the enemy Without us even lifting a finger, those enemies will be destroyed. So I ask you, Father, that your people will be encouraged. They'll be strengthened to do the things, Father, that you've asked them to do. That they will succeed. That they won't draw back knowing that there's more on our side than those that can possibly be against us. Let us leave here with courage. Let us leave here, Father, taking hold of those things that you've asked us to do, knowing that in the end, we're going to succeed. In Jesus' precious name, say amen with me. Amen. Hug about three folks.